Hello, I'm Paul Beckwith. I'm with the University of Ottawa Laboratory for Paleoclimatology. And I'm talking about the destruction of the Arctic sea ice. This is part two, um, the shredding of the Arctic sea ice um, in uh, mid-August. Um, so we've got another month in the melt season. What I was showing here in continuing from part one is this is the motion of the this is the motion, can I stop this? Let me see if I can stop it. Maybe that stops it, I don't know. Nope, oh well. Anyway, this shows the actual motion of the sea ice. Okay, the units are centimeters a second. I don't have the scale here, but from memory, this will be 50, 60, 70, maybe centimeters per second. High is the red and low is the um, going into yellow and, and these other colors. So the cyclone is the winds at the surface are whipping around here very fast, you know, um, very, very fast because it's a low pressure in the center, creates a temperature gradient, creates a pressure gradient, creates the winds because of, again, the Coriolis force drives it around uh, this direction in the Northern Hemisphere over a low pressure area. So we're getting the ice is being whipped around. So the key factors here are, um, it's also drawing in warmer water from the Pacific. It's pulling all this thick ice up here. Um, it also, it's very interesting because I think the export through here is reduced through the Nares Strait. And then through the Fram Strait, um, I think the export is increased. If you can see this ice coming down this way. I think the net balance, because this is a much wider strait, is that the export is, is larger, and the export's key, right? You don't have to melt the ice, you just have to port it out of the Ar Ar Arctic Ocean Basin and to get rid of it. So don't ask me why this is harder to get. There's a link here, you can play around with that link, you can probably change the numbers here and you can get other updates. I'm not sure why this isn't um, being put, put up where it was before. You have to search for it to get that, but it's a very, very interesting image. So, and then we can go down. Actually, let's leave it, let's leave it on here because I'll probably come back. Okay, so what are some of the other people saying about this? Well, this is uh, Robert Scribbler's uh, blog. Um, Okay, he's done another post. So this post is about July being the hottest temperature. Look at this, global average temperature. I mean, one degree above pre-industrial, like we're rocketing up here. 2016 is gonna be a massive um, increase. I mean, that's you now 1.25, 1.3 above pre-industrial. You know, we're supposed to stay below 1.5 for safety. Um, can you pick out 1998 on this graph? Well, right here, you know, no warming since 1998. I mean, forget about deniers, right? Like denier, like don't even mention them. I'm sorry, I, I mentioned them, okay? Don't even do that. They, you know, it's, it's nonsensical, these, these folks. Um, this is the July temp, this is, uh, this is the temperature each uh, season, each month, you know? And look at all these and look at this year. I mean, this year is unbelievably, you know, the, the, of course, you know, the El Nino helped here, but the El Nino is long gone and we're still skyrocketing up. By the way, I'm going to give a plug. Radio Ecoshock. Google it. Listen to the stuff. You know, if you're walking somewhere, if you're in the car, you know, band it into your car radio. Uh, listen to it. It's really good stuff. Alex Smith, a good friend of mine, and I'm giving a plug for him. I'm on his show quite a bit, but he interviews all the top scientists. Um, and also, and then he interviews me too, uh, so that's nice of him. Um, so um, basically, you know, look at the distribution. The Arctic's so warm, pole's so warm. Of course, this temperature difference is much smaller, so the jet streams slow down and are wavy, and we're, and we're getting extreme weather events galore. Um, look at this, the Ellicott flood. I did a video on that. Um, anyway, sorry, I got to get back to, uh, where are we? I want, I'm talking about the Arctic. Why did I get diverted? I'm, I'm, uh, here we go. Powerful cyclone to blow hole in thinning Arctic sea ice. So, so he talks, of, Scribbler talks about the 2012 gale. Um, and uh, so, you know, you get a large temperature difference between the land and the ocean temperatures. You get convection rising, you get these cyclones. 
I read a paper saying that these cyclones can last up to 30 days in the Arctic. The uh, Coriolis force is zero at the equator. It's maximum at the pole. So at the pole, the, whenever, some, whenever a storm tries to move southward, it, mo it, it veers strongly to the right and stays in the basin. So storms kind of get trapped up there and they're fed by the temperature difference between the surface um, of the ice and the upper high, you know, the, the temperatures around elsewhere. And uh, they, they uh, you know, you get this large convection and it feeds the storm. Um, you know, if there's a lot of fires in Siberia, then that pulls in smoke and stuff into the, into the region. Um, so in, in uh, so, so basically, you know, the ice got massacred at the beginning of August in 2012, and that led to the minimum. So, you know, if the cyclones this year continue going fast, you know, continue um, in duration, and we get more and more of them, then, you know, it's anybody's bet on how much sea ice will be left. Um, so this is Scribbler's blog here. You know, you've seen, you recognize this. This is sea surface temperature. This is the pressure showing the low, um, and so on. Okay, so, um, yeah, okay, that's the same thing. Okay, so climate reanalyzer. Just Google climate reanalyzer and have a look at this data. So this is the temperature, okay, so so the green is above zero, okay? So all these regions around here, this is the, the surface temperature above zero. You know, how is that relative to a long-term average? Hover the pointer over temperature anomaly, and you can see the temperatures uh, of, of being, you know, this is uh, about 10 degrees Celsius warmer, the dark brown areas. The lighter browns are, you know, anywhere from, you know, about five, you know, the, the, the very, these ones are maybe two or three degrees, five degrees, 10 degrees above normal. Look at, the, look at Greenland. Do you think the ice is doing well there? Okay, sea surface temperature. Um, anything, ab this is all above zero, of course. You know, it can go down to minus 1.8 if, if you've got um, ice with, uh, like the freezing point of, of seawater is minus 1.8. But if it's fresher, of course, it goes closer and closer to zero. So these are temperatures. So all around the ice, of course, it's water. It's above zero. Um, but you can get up to five, almost 10 degrees, very close to the ice. We'll get more on that. This is the anomaly. So very warm areas here, OK? Four degrees Celsius above normal. Uh, precipitation and cloud means sea level pressure. So look at this. These are the pressure lows. This is the main low here, which is the causes the cyclone to cycle around. But there's also cyclones here and here. Um, precipitable water, you know, surface winds. So surface winds, you know, the surface winds. This is in uh, miles per hour. You know, the per th these guys here are like 30, 34, 35 miles an hour. You know, and then of course in the center of the cyclone it drops to zero. It's in meters per second on the other scale. Um, jet stream winds. Okay, so there's the jet streams. Very streaky, hot. You know, fast here, fast here, fast here. But then slow elsewhere. You know, big dip here over North America. You know, so this would be this would be the strong trough here, and then the ridge up here, of course. Um, Sea ice and snow, you know, you can see the sort of extent of the ice there. So this is a very good site. Now, lastly, we'll look at Earth Null School and we'll see what's going on here. So just Google Earth Null School, you know, click on Earth down here. And it brings up the menu. So what do we have here? This is the, this is air at the surface. We're looking at the winds. Um, this is a spherical projection. You can, this is a very useful projection here um, if you want to extend it out to look at the whole world. Um, or you, we'll go back here. And of course, you can rotate this thing around. So I'll come up here and we'll look at the Arctic. Okay, and give it a minute to refresh, a few seconds. So this is what you can see. Um, if you click on this, it gives you the the wind speed, the direction and the wind speed here, kilometers an hour. You can see in the center of the cyclone, it goes much lower, almost to zero. You know, I can, if you use the slider on the mouse, you can expand it 
okay, to fo and then focus in on different regions. Um, so what else is going on here? What else can we tell from this? Well, we can get the um, we can get the jet streams by going to 250 millibar. Okay, so now you can see these jet streams and you can see all of the waviness. So tell me, like, is this the polar jet? Is this the subtropical jet? I mean, those classifications are archaic, really. They, they're, they're useful when you do averaging, but they're not really useful too much when you, when, you know, for day-to-day, -day, uh, you know, hourly data. Um, you can see the oceans here. Um, so the oceans, uh, you can see, in the, this, we're, we've got significant wave height, 1.39 meters. You know, this, these waves are three meters. Don't forget the ice is only a meter or two. Um, these waves are going to be causing some vertical mixing. Down below, the warmer water is going to be coming up. Um, sea surface temperatures around the ice. You can see that... Uh, this, the greens are, uh, you know, let's move around and see what we are. So 10 degrees Celsius. So these are 10 degrees Celsius. Here, here it's water, you know, but it's, uh, well, 1.1. Okay, so around the fringes there, it's got to be above zero, right? Uh, depends on the salinity. You know, you can have water at minus one degree Celsius and it's water because if it's very salty, but the fresh water is coming off here, so I would expect it to be mostly fresh. Sea surface temperature anomalies, um, you know, very much warmer than normal. Like, look at this region up here. You know, eight degrees warmer than normal, six degrees warmer than normal. Um, let's go back to uh, the air and let's go back to... You know, this is mean sea level pressure, okay? So this is these images. So you can see there's like a small cyclone here. There's our large cyclone going through the Arctic Basin. And there's another cyclone here, low pressure areas. So I just want to show you, um, let's, um, let's go back, let's go Earth here. Let's zoom in on the, on the Arctic region here. Let's go in really close, okay? so. I want you to still see what there is. So we got Greenland here. Okay, so you can see at the center there, you know, there's no wind really. You know, so you can try to find the areas with maximum wind. Pressure, sorry, this is pressure and wind. So 984, oh, oh yeah, what was the pressure here? So 977 hexapascals. Can I zoom in more? Yeah. Okay, so 977 hexapascals, and then as you go out here, 29 kilometers an hour, 979, 44 kilometers. You can try to play, you know, see where the, what where the highest winds are. Okay, it's tapered off. It's not quite as strong as it was before. And remember that you can correlate this. So this wind is whipping around. You know, like I say, a low pressure area by definition, it's higher pressure all around. It's just that pressure difference that makes the wind move. If the Earth wasn't rotating, you were fixed, and the wind would all be coming to the center, you know, but then it would build up there. So what, what would happen? It would have to change altitude. This is only a particular, this is at the uh, surface, right? Um, so what happens is, is because the Earth is rotating and the Coriolis force drives things around, then things start moving this way. And like I said, the Coriolis force is maximum at the North Pole, also at the South Pole, um, and things rotate the opposite direction in the South Pole. But because, so if this whole storm tries to move out of the basin, it, mo it, it, it moves very quickly. If it's the whole thing is moving, it will start veering to the right because of the Coriolis force. So rather than going straight to lower latitudes, it veers around and it's always veering around. So that tends to confine the, the storm. But I just wanted to show you back to here because remember, remember this view here, okay? And you can see how the ice is moving. So this is the motion of the ice and this is the motion of the wind. So anyway, the sea ice is being slaughtered right now, so stay tuned to see what happens.